Dr. Needleman, why don't we start with you? Good morning, Mr. Chairman. I'm Herbert Needleman. I'm Professor of Psychiatry and Pediatrics at the University of Pittsburgh. I'm also a member of the American Academy of Pediatrics Committee on Environmental Health in the Institute of Medicine. Uh, I'm pleased to be here to testify in support of House uh, 2840. I congratulate you and Mr. Sikorsky on authoring, recognizing an important problem and dealing with it effectively. When I last testified here in 1979, there was considerable agree disagreement about the uh, impact of lead at low dose on children. That's been effectively settled uh, in the period since that time. And there is a, a broad consensus on the part of everybody except the lead industry and its spokesman that lead is extremely toxic at extremely low doses. Uh, and the safe level of it has yet to be defined. In 1979, the actions of your committee were uh, instrumental in bringing into concordance the science at that time with the federal policy, and as a result, legislation allowed the removal of lead from gasoline, and blood leads in this country in children and adults dropped step by step over time. That was a real public health triumph, and, and this committee deserves a major part of the credit for that action. That was a federal action that was necessary and effective. <clears throat> Since I uh, testified then, there's been an explosion of, of scientific knowledge from human studies and from the animal laboratories about the effects of lead. Uh, and as a result of that, uh, the, we now recognize official federal declarations that this is the most serious environmental disease of children. And as you know, the uh, Dr. James Mason commissioned the CDC to issue a strategic plan, which is a historic document. It needs legs. Uh, I want to make three points. The first is that the more we study lead, the more we find effects at lower and lower doses in, in broader and broader systems in the human body. And we, that process is not over, but we now know that the uh, toxic level of lead in children can be measured at least down to 10 micrograms per deciliter in the child's blood. And that 17% of all American children exceed 15. Uh, being uh, rich does not immunize you against having lead toxicity. 7% of favored whites, according to the Agency for Toxic Substances, su substances have blood leads over 15. Being poor, however, increases the risk radically. Of black children in poverty who enter the first grade, 55% begin their education with this handicapping condition. That is a datum that our society will reject at its peril. The second point I want to make is that this disease is totally preventable, and Dr. Mason and CDC acknowledge that. Uh, and in, the third point is that in doing this, we can accomplish a number of social goods. If you map where lead is piled up in superabundance, and if you map where housing is in, decent housing is in short supply, and if you map where jobs are in short supply, the three maps are virtually identical. So uh, what would a rational, unbound person do with this disequilibrium? Well, you might say, why don't we take the unemployed and train them in safety letting and pay them, and for the same health dollar, we could get a decrease in unemployment, a very dangerous uh, uh, factor in our uh, nation at this point, put more housing back into decent circumstances and wipe the disease out. So this is, uh, uh, I think, uh, perhaps utopian, but I think it's practical utopianism. The most important cause of lead poisoning is paint. There's no disagreement about it. Water is important, dust is important, soil is, is important. But of the children I see in my clinic every Wednesday with blood leads of 25 or 30 and reports of behavior disorders or speech uh, retardation, the, we uh, generally identify in a high proportion of those children peeling paint that the child has access to. And occasionally I see a kid with a blood lead of 80, and in that circumstance there's no doubt about what the source was. We find peeling paint in that household. Now we've known about lead poisoning if, since antiquity. We've known about childhood lead poisoning for 100, disease, uh, 100 years, but very little has been done about this disease. And I've pondered this and I've identified at least four factors that are responsible for the fact that we have not dealt with this effectively and, and are perhaps only beginning to, to uh, do something about it. The first is the uh, conventional wisdom is that it has a disease of poor inner city minorities. And uh, uh, related to that is the implicit assertion that if the mother took better care of the child, this child would not have gotten sick. And once that happens, then federal or local responsibility is jettisoned. 
The second is that with the passage of the Lead Paint Poisoning Prevention Act and the removal of lead from gasoline, some people assume that the disease has disappeared. That, in fact, is not true. Blood leads have come down, but we now recognize toxicity at lower, lower doses. The third place, academic medicine has not been charmed by this disease. It's not liver transplants or gene therapy. You don't see any advertisements of corporate jets taking children to hospitals for treatment for lead poisoning. And the fourth that has been discussed here already this morning, that's the failure of some parts of the federal government to deal effectively with this. I exempt the Public Health Service and CDC from this. When I first began to get into this field about 20 years ago or more, the, there was a nebulous organization called the Bureau of Community Environmental Management, which had responsibility for uh, lead. This was turned over to Dr. Houck and the CDC, and first, the first time a professional approach was this uh, began to take place, and we began to understand and deal with the disease. And the lead industry have, has attempted to obscure this. So there are four or five reasons that have to be understood if we're going to deal effectively with, uh, with lead poisoning. Uh, I, I want to close by telling you a, a little anecdote. In 1963, the uh, Director General of the World Health Organization was approached with a plan to eradicate smallpox, and he was skeptical about this in the extreme, and he did not want to do it, but his hand was being forced, so he said, well, it's going to fail, so let's appoint an American to head it. And the CDC and Dr. Henderson, Don, Donald Henderson, headed that, and uh, when Dr. Mason's wall is a plaque celebrating the 10th anniversary of the last case of smallpox. This is an eminently preventable disease. We can have the same course if we have the same kind of dedication in dealing with lead poisoning. And uh, I think the bill that you propose uh, does give legs to the strategic plan and is a healthy first step in that direction. Thank you.